Hello and welcome to another edition of another book review. This week I'll be reviewing Dream Hoarders by Richard Reeves. I'll talk very briefly about the author, go into an overview of what the book is about, talk about what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, who I'd recommend the book to, and finish off with what I'll be reading for next time. Uh, I read this on ebook, so I won't have a cover to share with you this week, unfortunately. Um, but Richard Reeves is a um, uh, fairly well-known pundit. He's done some writing for The Atlantic. He's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. He's written a few different books. This is probably still his best known book. This came out in 2017. What Dream Hoarders is about is at a time of uh, income inequality in the United States seems to be growing at a really rapid level. There was a, has been a lot of focus on the top 1% of people, you know, your Elon Musks, your Jeff Bezoses of the world, and how they are uh, just being able to hoard uh, money through the tax system uh, and really cementing class positions that were before more more flexible, more porous, that people were able to kind of more easily move up the uh, the income ladder, um, the quintiles, uh, the income quintiles. And Richard Reeves basically says, you know, to really get a full understanding of this, we really need to look at what is the top 20% of income earners. Uh, he The number he uses is about $120,000 for a uh, a household, if you earn more than that on average, you are in the top 20%, and he dubs this group the, the dream hoarders. And the reason he looks at them is because they have obviously larger numbers and are able to enact some of these policies that he believes have worked to um, uh, tamp down social mobility in an unfair way. Uh, he looks at the amount of wage growth for this group compared to the other four quintiles over the last, say, 40 years. Uh, he talks about earned and unearned advantage. Uh, he centers the book. What I thought was really interesting was he centers the book in discussion with Charles Murray Coming Apart and Robert Putnam's uh, Our Kids, neither of which, unfortunately, I've had the chance to read. I've wanted to read Coming Apart for years, which hasn't gone around to it. But he kind of he, he, he centers them in those books just because he and they look at class distinctions in the United States slightly differently. So he does, I think, smartly say this is what I'm looking at as far as class distinctions. This is how I'm defining it. Class in the United States is really famously very hard to pin down because the class distinctions here don't necessarily uh, carry to other countries. So predominantly he looks at uh, college education as one of the key components to being in this upper middle class group. I think at one point he says 60% of upper middle class kids by I, meaning people whose parents are parent or parents are in the upper middle class will go on to complete college. And so you, instead of college being a, a tool for upward mobility, meaning you can take people who are for maybe working poor, give them a college degree, and they are able to use that college degree to promote themselves and are able to move up the, the ladder, as it were, uh, to become more upwardly mobile. And he does, and I will say for another pro of, of the book, I, I think he doesn't shy away from the uncomfortable fact a lot of people have with, you know, for you to have to have people who were born maybe middle class or, or lower middle class, for them to move up to being upper middle class, by definition, someone would have to move back down in terms of their relative position in this situation. So at any one time, 20% of households are in the upper quintile. And so uh, for them to, for someone else to make it to that upper quintile, by definition, someone would have to move out of it. And so he doesn't shy away from that, which I think is uncomfortable for a lot of people. I, I think the examples that he uses uh, sometimes leave some things to be desired, which I'll get into a moment. But I think he lays out his cards in his argument pretty strongly in terms of this is where we are and this is where we see that, that things are starting to cement. I think he also talks a little bit about Charles Murray's, I don't know if it's Charles Murray's idea, but the idea of a sort of mating, which is, People who have college degrees typically marry other people with college degrees, and they tend to uh, replicate wherever their their class structure is. So, if both your parents were in this class, there's high, high likelihood that you will also be in the class, and, and that's when he gets into the the idea of you know fair and unfair advantage. Um, there's a lot to the book. I think it's a really really interesting jumping off point, and I think you could give this book to. A group of people and have a really interesting discussion. So I will say that that's not necessarily anything to do with um, how well the, some of the arguments are executed. It's more of the book is relatively short. You can give it to people, and I think it's a good jumping off point because I think that there are some things that people will have issues with in the book, um, and there there are things that people can argue. 
Uh, I will say, just moving on to the cons, uh, I heard a lot of Richard Reeves. I watched some of his Aspen Institute videos and other similar things when he was promoting the book a few years ago. This came out in 2017. And there was one really, I thought, pretty strong critique of him, I think, that was published in Vox. I'll see if I can pull it up, but basically he, there's a refusion of this idea that really is the top 20%. In that Vox article says, you know, it really is the top 1% that's, that has a lot of the, the things that are, are what Richard Reeves says are, are cementing these unfair advantages. So I'll see if I can pull that up there as well for people who want to check that out. Um, so that being said, what are some things I didn't care for in the book? I think there are some times where, where Richard Reeves inserts himself that I found kind of annoying, um, and he kind of gives his asides at some places. There are some passages I had to reread, which I, I found kind of annoying. There's a In the beginning of the book, he mentions Trump and Trump's uh, supporters, and when he kind of is starting to talk about the class distinctions between um, different groups of people. He, In my opinion, and I, I, th I thought I may have been misreading it, but I, I think I was. I went back and reread the transcripts. You know, I don't find myself defending uh, Hillary Clinton very often, but he does misattribute something to Hillary Clinton uh, in the basket of deplorable speech, um, which I thought was just really kind of strange. It was just very easy for him to have gone back and, and double-checked what she said. And I think he misinterprets or misappropriates what, what she actually said. Uh, I don't think she was making a class distinction there. I think she was making a distinction based on people being bigoted. But So those are some of the little, little things. The big big examples in the book, my biggest issue with the book is that the things that he seems to have the most passion and frustration for, I, I think I found to be largely symbolic. And the things that would move the needle the most in terms of class mobility, I don't associate uh, as much with um, class mobility as I do with equity and fairness. And so that may seem like a weird thing to argue, but to me, when he talks about NIMBYism, if I was going to say that the moral reason behind NIMBYism is because we are roughly one to two million houses short in this country and we have a really terrible homelessness problem, I have more, I, I take, I, to me that's the driving, if you were going to invest more in housing, like they've, you know, like I read Evicted a few years ago and I'll link that below as well, that to me would be the moral reason to do it, not really because it would maybe help some people move from the, the middle class to the upper middle class. And, uh, so the, the, the kind of solutions he put forward are, are a little either, I think, politically very, very heavy to lift uh, or just kind of uh, symbolic. He also is there at times where I think he's a little fast and loose with his statistics in terms of, I remember one thing he, he cited for the home mortgage interest deduction. And he says, you know, that really predominantly helps upper middle class people, uh, which it, it does. But when you compare the upper middle class to the bottom quintile, then yes, home ownership is going to, anything dealing with, with being able to reduce the cost of home ownership is going to benefit the top upper quintile because they have houses and people in the bottom quintile don't have houses. And so I thought that was a little bit of a misleading statistic there. I also say if you're not someone who has kids, a lot of the book is focused on uh, the morals and ethics of where is the line between giving people an unfair advantage and, and what is the line between giving people a fair advantage in terms of things like college applications, which is a large part of the book. And the, the thing that I think was missing from it is there's a difference between making it into this upper middle class and staying there. And your, your parents can give you all the advantages in the world, but if you're a consultant or a lawyer or a doctor, you still have to have the, the drive to work 50 to 60 hours a week. He doesn't really touch on that either. That to me is something that is also part of the discussion is, you know, when you talked about earned or unearned and who should be here and who shouldn't be there, you know, uh, upper middle class professionals work a lot of hours and he, he notes that but then doesn't go like one step deeper into well what does that mean when I'm talking about earned and earned advantage um, and so there's all that the things that he is most passionate about to me with the small things that I, I, I thought were largely symbolic the 529 plans and legacy admissions um, it wasn't quite clear to me if you ended legacy admissions at, at selective private institutions if those admissions offices believe that legacy uh, admissions gives them a, more, a higher likelihood of making money through endowments and donations and things like that. To me, the obvious thing that would happen if you remove those legacy admissions wouldn't be that you would take someone from the, the bottom quintile or the second, second to last bottom quintile. You would just take someone else in the upper middle class who, whose parents were, were wealthy. So instead of it being your dad went to Harvard 
and you got into Harvard because your dad went to Harvard, it would be your dad is a doctor, your mom's a lawyer, you got into Harvard because they have a lot of money and your legacy or not a legacy didn't really have anything to do with it, but they still basically have re replaced one large donor with another. So I, that wasn't quite clear to me. And the 529 plan is, is also one of those things where a 529 plan, for those who don't know, I don't want to get into too technical detail, but a 529 plan is essentially a savings plan uh, where someone can put aside money for their children to go to school years before they go. So it's basically a tax-free savings plan. He has a large problem with this because he doesn't. He feels that it's the people who go use the, the savings plans are almost always upper middle class people. They're much, much more likely to do it. My, my problem with that logic is, well, in your own writing, you, you know that upper middle class people are much, much higher to have completed college. And one would think that upper middle class people who have both completed college would know about the 529 savings plan. It wasn't quite clear to me that the problem itself wasn't just a communication problem where you let other people know who are maybe, whose parents maybe didn't go to college about the 529 savings plan. And it is one of those things where if you're a, a lower middle class person and your family doesn't have a lot of money, but they set aside 200 bucks a month or 300 bucks a month from the time that you're born, uh, so you can go to college, it can add up quite a bit in terms of taxes that you would save. And so it wasn't quite clear to me that this is really this boogeyman that he kind of makes it out to be. Um, so those are, those are my issues with the book. I, I do, it was, it was kind of hard for me to read it because I, I did also read it as someone who, you know, I myself don't have kids. And so a lot of those things didn't really feel applicable to me. And also that I think a lot of people, and I've, I've read critiques of the book where it's really difficult to make a, a, a moral, uh, stance on some of these things. If it's unclear of when something is an unfair advantage or when it's a fair advantage. So for instance, if, if you're able to, to take your children to cello lessons and it helps them on their, their Harvard application, is that an unfair advantage or a fair advantage? It wasn't clear to me where that line was. So I think that was it. He also, in reading some of these things, I, I read it too from the perspective of, I could tell Richard Reeves was a little bit older because I, I don't think the, the uh, Great Recession was in his mind when he wrote this, because I think a lot of the things that he notes in this may have changed slightly due to the Great Recession. But overall, if I was to recommend this to book to people, I would say uh, it's a quick read. You can read it on an airplane in a couple hours, and I think it gives people a jumping off point for this discussion. I don't didn't find myself particularly swayed by a lot of the issues, I'll be honest with you. Um, and it, it was strange to me of how small ball uh, some of it felt in terms of, you know, we have this huge problem of income inequality and, and mobility is stagnating in, in the United States. To bring up things like 529 plans repeatedly and to bring up legacy admissions. I, and I think Richard Reeves notes that, you know, the legacy admissions thing is probably more of a symbolic thing than anything else. But he is coming from England where he just feels that it's like just blatantly unfair to people and, and really, really hates it, you know, um, really hates the legacy admissions. <laughs> you know, I, I've never met anybody in America who hates the legacy admissions as much as Richard Reeves seems to hate the legacy admissions. So, um, so that's the book. I, I do think that if you're looking to have a discussion about uh, income inequality and you want to expand the discussion a little bit from the top 1%, I think this is actually a really interesting book. Um, some of the more, you know, weightier issues when you get into, you know, is it moral for people to pass on their uh, intelligence to other people and their, you know, this example of hard work. I would be interested too in the legacy admissions of how many people would have gotten into the school anyway had it not been for legacy admissions, which he doesn't have numbers for and says, you know, I have numbers for. But that also to me is kind of a question. So that is Dream Hoarders. Uh, I know that there are some some critiques of it. I'll, like I said, I'll try to pull that one up. I'm actually going to be reading another Richard Reeves book, uh, the one that he just published of Boys and Men, and I'll have that probably up in a week or so. Uh, but if you have read Dream Hoarders and, and had stronger feelings about it in terms of if I'm way off base, if you really enjoyed it, if there's something I'm missing, please let me know. I know it's a relatively popular book when it came out. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear your opinions of it. Until next time, uh, please follow me on Twitter. I'll have that below and also link to Evicted, which I think is a book that uh, kind of speaks to this book in some ways as well. So until next time, bye.